So I'm housed in the theater department at USD, but my research and teaching is grounded in the field of performance studies. And I wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of what that means, because it helps to frame a lot of what I do. So performance study is a, is a field that's interested in performance, not only in the artistic realm, but also in the social and cultural context. This broad spectrum approach includes things like ritual, sporting events, political addresses. It also includes performances in our daily lives like gender, race, class, to name only a few. It's also a field that sees a lot of value in taking a scholar practitioner approach. Theories about performance help to shape the kinds of work that we make and our creative activities develop and shape our theoretical understandings of performance. My work sits in that in-between space and the circulation between thinking about and making has been particularly generative over the years. I've done research on everything from the living and working conditions of chorus girls and the big choruses of the 10s and 20s um, to also thinking about how to teach and assess what makes for effective collaboration itself. Because it's an inherently interdisciplinary field, I always tell my students it's particularly well suited for incorporating your hobbies and your passions and bringing that to the center of your work. In recent years, something that's been increasingly at the forefront for me personally has been the climate crisis. During our gl recent global pandemic, I was also quite alarmed by how widespread distrust of scientific expertise and knowledge helped lead to the extension and deepening of the health emergencies across the globe. That same distrust is fueling the continual rejection of climate change as a real and present danger. So while the shutdown was really awful in some ways, it did create this interesting opportunity to think through ways that both the climate and science could be central to my own work. I had a lot to draw from and be inspired by. So institutions like the Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science and the Climate Change Communication Program at Yale do an excellent job of helping scientists come up with better communication strategies to reach a larger public. And I've noticed in recent years, more and more of my theater students are identifying climate as one of the most important issues to them. It's reflecting these larger trends that the Yale's 2021 opinion maps show. One thing these numbers don't really show, however, is the depth of the concern, the level of distress that the students have. That concern is deep and their worry is profound. Some refer to this as climate grief and it's increasingly pervasive. So I wondered how might non-scientists like myself get involved? Could I help my theater students engage as activist artists with climate struggles? So I drew heavily from the field of uh, science communication to look for some best practices. One of which is that it's important to not just identify problems, marinating and how bad things are, but to focus on effective action, drawing upon solution-based approaches instead. We also have to foster coalitions and collaboration. As James Engel writes in Teaching Climate Change in the Humanities, a response to the climate crisis requires an unprecedented coordination of science, politics, international relations, culture, technology, the arts, religious stewardship, and education. So at the University of San Diego, one of our core requirements is advanced integration. We focus on the liberal arts and both at the lower and upper division levels, students are making connections between disciplines. They're applying knowledge in a range of contexts and the focus is on synthesis via certain integrative projects. So in the spring of 2021, I was able to teach an advanced integration special topics course called Telling the Story of Science. This course was linked with an environmental topics course taught by Dr. Michelle Boudria in the Environmental and Ocean Sciences Department, or EOS. Additionally, we worked with Soroya Rowley, um, who has a lot of expertise in applied theater and working with various communities to create theater together. They were working on their masters and peace studies and our projects in class served as the basis for their capstone project. So we used an experiential learning approach to structure the interactions between the students and our courses. This has four stages. The first is concrete experience, doing, experiencing the thing. 
Then you review and reflect on the experience in the reflective observation stage. After that is abstract conceptualization where you're drawing conclusions before you move to active experimentation and planning for the next cycle. So as you can see, this process is guided by a cyclical framework. The learner is engaging in a feedback loop. It's not thinking about knowledge acquisition as, as a straight line coming from the teacher to the student. Ugh, not a fan of that one. So we structured the course around three projects that each built on each other. The first was to develop a pitch. The second was a short play of about five minutes. And the third was a longer play of about 30 minutes in length. As you can see, each cycle, each project had its own developmental cycle. So Soroya led some introductory workshops for each groups of students at the beginning. The theater students were trained in how to facilitate and to serve as playwrights. The EO students learned about communication strategies mined from theater to help more effectively share their scientific knowledge about what they were learning. The topics included things like deforestation, plastics, and renewable energy sources. Here is a more detailed view of what went into the second project, the short play. We used three sub-cycles because we wanted at least a third draft of a script before going into production. Each group consisted of one theater student and between two or three EO students. The theater students were able to use the skills they had developed in project one to get again serve as facilitator and playwright in the collaboration. They interviewed the EO students in the focus group, asking them about their research and also to share stories from their personal experiences relating to what they were studying. Those interviews served as the inspiration for the first draft of the play. In cycle 2B, the theater students got feedback on their scripts from both Soroya and myself, and then they implemented that feedback before sharing it with their EOS teammates to get another round of feedback, which became the third draft. So we had initially planned for the students to create live theater pieces, but because we were still remote, thanks to the pandemic, uh, the students used the scripts to make videos instead. Uh, so there's a lot going on in this video. And uh, for now, I'd like to start by talking about how it's not actually about the science related to plastics. Um, the interviews were conducted pretty early on with the EOS students when they were early in their research process. Um, so that's not entirely surprising. Um, but I do, I do think this video really highlights their desire for effective action and using art as a means to inspire change. It also hits on some sources of their frustration, um, such as with preceding generations, with educators, with politicians, um, and I have to say, this was something that was very surprising to me. This bubbled up so much during our class. Um, and it caused me to reflect on how these students are the ones that grew up reading Harry Potter. They believe that some will help them, like the Dumbledores, the McGonagalls, the Order of the Phoenix, but they believe they're mostly going to have to do things themselves without regular help. And sometimes people in power are actively working against them. You know, I totally understand where this stems from, um, but that mindset works against the unprecedented coordination we're aiming for. So how could we make connections instead was something that we thought a lot about. The public policy piece is such a critical one for addressing the climate crisis. So we thought it would be helpful to give the students some exposure to and engagement with some local politicians who are actively working towards addressing climate issues. So in April, 2021, we co-hosted a joint UCSD USD panel on science policy and communication. And it featured Serge Dedina, the mayor of Imperial Beach and representative Mike Levin from the California 49th. Um, if you're interested in that panel, you can actually see it. Um, it's posted on the education and outreach page for the C3 lab at UCSD. The link's at the bottom of the page. Um, so personally, I thought the panel with Dedina and Levin was a really successful event. But the suspicion and distrust that the students have runs pretty deep. And it definitely shows up in the Q&A part of the event. For instance, 
Representative Mike Levin was discussing his ongoing efforts to relocate the waste at San Onofre, and a student asked for his assurance that wherever it does go, it won't disproportionately affect indigenous populations. Levin, of course, acknowledged that as a really important concern, but he couldn't give them a definite answer that they don't know where this waste is going to go. So the students were really dissatisfied with that answer. And interestingly, in our conversation afterwards, it became clear that some presumed the worst. They actually thought he was actively deceiving them. Um, and it's, I'm thinking a lot about how it's when public policy officials and scientists get into unknown territory that there can be some problems when communicating with the public. So for example, we can see that in what it was like for the world population to experience the emergent of, emergence of this novel coronavirus pandemic. You know, new information would be learned and the recommendations for protection would change. And it was very frustrating to some people like the initial recommendations for hand washing or wearing a mask in certain uh, situations because we knew X, but now we know Y. And so the recommendations changed. I, I'm sure we all know this. This is, this is an inherent part of working on a novel problem or to innovating in any field of research. When we've gone past what's known, the exploratory spaces, when we're discovering, we have to adapt and that can be challenging. It's the nature of scientific knowledge. It's not static, it evolves, it changes. Um, and that was one of the most interesting experiences for me in this whole process was working on people who themselves had different degrees of scientific knowledge. The EOS students at the start of their journey, and then those with a deeper knowledge base, uh, the scientific expertise. So if you were able to attend the March Ethics Forum session, you met one of those experts that we worked with, Dr. George Porter. He's a computer scientist from UCSD, and he talked about the environmental impacts of modern computing, of which there are many. Uh, if you were like me, a lot of what he covered was new, um, and it involves things like the high carbon costs of cloud computing, the massive amounts of e-waste that's produced globally, so he came and gave a lecture as part of the first project for my students. And they combined what they learned from him with those theatrical devices and story te storytelling techniques that they were learning to create a pitch. They got feedback for him about their ideas. Now, their narrative-driven choices had to also serve the science. And we had to find ways to navigate simplifying things enough to make sense for the general public and to serve the story while also maintaining the integrity and accuracy of some pretty complex technically based concepts. Translating the science-based material did take some simplification and or streamlining. Um, so it was so vital to have his active participation throughout the whole cycle of work. What was exciting is that during the summer after the class concluded, we were able to build on the class on the pitches and do a new cycle that allowed us to go into much more depth. So Dr. Porter and I jointly funded three USD undergraduate theater students as well as Soroya Rowley. And we created two full length scripts and one involved also writing two original songs. We made two videos the top row of images show our video, The Closet of Doom. It's tackling the e-waste problem and there's a Veruca salt type figure in the center who wants all the phones and she ends up getting pulled into the closet of doom where all the outdated phones live. So in addition to directing the video, I also got to be a voiceover performer for one of the phones, which was a total blast. Um, the bottom row of images are from our second script and video called Application Idol. And it features two apps competing against each other via song based on how green they are. Um, and if they're supported by you know, the cloud and if they require the newest device, et cetera. We also made two supporting educational videos featuring Dr. Porter, one on cloud computing and the other on e-waste. And finally, we compiled a guidebook it details our process and shares some of the resources we found 
for translating science-based material into creative pieces. Again, all of these are available on the education and outreach page for the C3 lab. We really wanted to share the process as much as we shared what we produced. We wanna make doing this kind of work as accessible as possible. The more, the better. This may be something for you personally to consider, particularly as half the rubric for evaluating NSF grants is related to broader impacts. Education and outreach is a key component of that. Novel and creative ways of delivering the work can help set grant applications apart, just saying. Um, so our computer scientist was already doing some outreach with us when he outlined the problem. Um, and it, it was an interesting process to see that when you have expertise in a field, it can be so helpful and also so difficult to remember how to talk to non-experts to do that translation. As theater makers approaching this creatively, it was really easy to get overwhelmed by the scale. Uh, by the global dimensions of the environmental impacts of modern computing. So to find our footing, we started locally. We started with how this involved us personally. Uh, that's a technique drawn from experiential learning and also from community theater making. Um, our daily interactions with our phones, the things that, you know, we had, okay, hourly or minute to minute interactions with phones, um, became this really useful touch point for all of us. Um, and our scientist helped to give us context for that thing that we interacted with on a daily basis. When explaining the carbon footprint of data centers, he used this image. Well, this was the spark that led to the creation of the application idle story. At, at its heart about the story, it's that some apps can be greener. Um, when we were developing the script and the lyrics, our science consultant gave us some really important feedback because we initially streamlined it a little too far and we simplified the energy usage to just being on the phone related to the apps. Now it does run on the phone, but another part runs in the data centers. So you have to think about both when accounting for the energy costs. We also knew that we could rely upon many of our audience members having their own personal experiences with their phones themselves and that they could actually do something about what we were addressing. So in the closet of doom, the takeaway is use your phone longer, and when you do have to upgrade, don't throw it in the trash. There were some aspects that posed more of a challenge for translating into solution-based stories. For instance, the amount of computing needs is skyrocketing because of things like machine learning. The algorithms that compile Google searches and making video recommendations for us on Netflix are so demanding in terms of energy usage. And what is going on inside those data centers is a much more complicated thing to understand from an engineering and science perspective. We did touch on that for Application Idle in presenting this idea that, that apps could be greener um, and some could be you know, much more than others, depending on how they were hosted and also the energy sources used for data centers. Um, but it's a complicated problem and that companies employ data center servers and run them with various energy sources is an interesting challenge for what we can do about that in terms of direct action. In focusing on solution-based stories, we certainly don't want to suggest that the responsibility for action is solely for those on the consumer side. Yeah, it's a drag. Uh, it's a common one when dealing with environmental issues. Uh, so for instance, it's something we had to take into account regarding plastics. Manufacturers make all these kinds of plastics. The companies use it in countless products. But when it's detected in higher and higher levels in our ocean and, and landfills, well, it's the fault of the consumers for not recycling. You know, throwing things into blue bins is certainly important, but it's not going to fully solve that environmental issue. Um, and so with data centers, bringing awareness to things like the huge carbon footprint, which is larger than the airline industry, um, can be really important if we can use that awareness to activate the power we have as consumers. Companies will deliver if there's a demand. We can see this in the cl classic example of cage-free eggs. 
Over several decades, there was a group of activists that increased awareness about cage-free eggs as an alternative and consumer demand shifted. Now we have multiple cage-free options in the grocery stores. This is an image from a Target store. Um, and some restaurants exclusively use cage-free eggs and use that as a selling point. So awareness that leads to activism can be solution-based because it can drive change. It just has to be directed accordingly. So that's an area that needs more work around data centers, and it's part of my next project to tackle for C3 Lab outreach efforts. Um, again, there's some great sources of in in inspiration to draw from. I'm going to share with you one example of that, which is Climate Voice. Um, Bill Weil was the uh, the originally the uh, green energy czar at Google. Yes, that was actually his title. Um, and the director of sustainability at Facebook um, before he left industry uh, to create a nonprofit advocacy organization called Climate Voice. It's specifically geared towards creating inroads at big tech companies by getting their employees and students to petition for greener options. So clearly one approach is to define the audience for these stories in particular ways and to narrow cast towards those decision makers and tech companies. This is yet another reason why I want my students to engage with public policymakers and elected officials. Just like companies responding to consumer demand, politicians will do things if there's public demand. Voting is active and so is finding ways to communicate priorities. If companies had to contend with regulations or carbon taxes, as well as hearing consumer demand for greener energy sources and getting suggestions from the research community for more efficient architectures within data centers, well, now we're getting somewhere. Now we've got some coordination. So there's a lot of um, work to be done and in my own experiential uh, learning process, I'm so excited for the new process, uh, the new cycle. And uh, thank you so much for listening.